But, you know, we really believe that this year is going to be 20 year, 2018 is going to be a year of breakthrough. How many of you believe 2018 is going to be a year of breakthrough? We're, we're going to start with where we're going in this series today. Because as you can see, it's about victory. I, and like many of you, I'm just going to speak for myself. You, you understand something? It's okay for the preacher to be honest sometimes. <laughs> how, how about that? Yeah, you know, we, we struggle, we fight as Christians, and we get overwhelmed, we get taken aback. We deal with everything else the world deals with. And somewhere in my mind and heart, at the end, end of last year, I begin thinking, is this really what victory looks like? In fact, I know this is not what victory feels like. I, I grew up playing in athletics, uh, and, and I love winning. Let me give you just a little clue about me. I hate losing. I mean, uh, one of my kids are over here, the other two are serving, and they will tell you one thing about their dad is that I have never let my kids beat me at anything. <laughs> anything. Uh, if they did it, they did it fair and square. But it wasn't without me trying everything in my power to win. Like, you really sure about that shot? You sure about, you sure about that club? You, surely, you really want to hit that club? You say, you surely don't torture your kids like that. I probably do. <laughs> and, and honestly, I was tired. I'm going to be honest with you. I was just tired of losing to the devil. So I came back to what I believe God is speaking to me, not just to me, but to our body in this new year. And I really believe today, if you will listen and hear here, God will change your life forevermore. So let's pray over the word today. Lord, we come. There's so many things we can't do in and of our flesh. We can't save ourselves. We can't free ourselves. There's a lot we can do in hope, but Lord, faith does so much more. And so we come this morning, Lord, desirous of what you want for us. Asking you to open our eyes and ears to hear what you're saying through your word today. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm going to date myself a little bit. Uh, I, I'm a child that went from, believe it or not, black and white televisions to color televisions. How many know what I'm talking about? And VHF and UHF channels and fine-tuning everything so you could watch your favorite channels. And I remember growing up, there was this one comedian, uh, one, of, one of the first, I think, women comedians in our country. Uh, and she was always intriguing to me because of her looks. And her name was Phyllis Diller. How many of you remember Phyllis Diller? Uh, and now you can look on the internet and they have a, some quotes and some sayings of hers. They call them Dillerisms. I didn't say dilly dilly, I said Dillerisms. <laughs> <laughs> and I came across some of those this morning and I thought, these are really funny. Uh, because if you know her and you can hear her saying it uh, with, with that long cigarette in her hand and, and just in that raspy voice, she says, whatever you may look like, marry a man your own age. As your beauty fades, so will his eyesight. <laughs> she said this about being, being a mom. She said, cleaning your house while your kids are still growing up is like shoveling the sidewalk before it stops snowing. She said this about women. The reason women don't play football is because 11 of them would never wear the same outfit in public. I like this one, what she said about her kids. She says, I want my kids to have all the things I couldn't afford. Then I want to move in with them. <laughs> She's also one, you've heard this quote. We spend the first 12 months of our children's lives teaching them to walk and talk and the next 12 years telling them to sit down and shut up. <laughs> How many remember what, what Phyllis looked like? How many remember what she looked like? Uh, this was one of her funnier sayings. She says, Burt Reynolds one, once asked me out. I was in his room. <laughs> uh, lastly, she says, you know you're getting old when they've discontinued your blood type. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you what I believe today. Not what just I believe, but I know. I know that God wants to bless us. 
We've already said the scripture, Matthew 6, 33, it says, seek the kingdom of God. I think that's where everything starts. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. And in fact, what he's saying here is put God first and his interests first and he's going to bless you. Now, where we're going today, I have to put the disclaimer on this because I know for a fact if you've been in the church any number of years, that people take the word of God and they twist it for their own selfish interest and wants and prosperity. I get it all. But we've made a mistake in the church. And I'll tell you where we made the mistake it is that as much as some of that stuff was truth, we threw it all out uh, because we said, you know what? Those people went way to an excess. And so we threw out some of the things in the word of God that are important and vital for us as believers. Today, I'm going to talk to you about your authority as a son and daughter of God. Now listen to me as we talk about this authority. This authority is not given for your own selfish whims and wants and desires. This authority is given to you for his kingdom. That God wants to work through you for his kingdom. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first God's interest. And so when we get into this today, this is my prayer, is that all of a sudden a light's going to come on. You're, you're, going to, you're going to think, man, I've been a Christian. Well, I've known this before, or I've heard this before, or what in the world? Why is this not in practice in my life? Because when it talks about Jesus in the Word of God, if you've ever read anything about Jesus, it says he came and he taught and he walked around this earth as one having authority. He never begged demons to leave. He never had to work up faith to get a blind person to be able to see. He just spoke a word. And so he dies on a cross. And before he ascends into heaven and goes to his throne and is seated. In Matthew 28, there's a verse he left us. And we need to catch all of it today. Matthew 28, 18 says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given, read it with me. Hold on a sec. I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. All, it, does it say limited authority? Or there are some exclusions that come into play here. That in the 21st centuries, there's going to be autoimmune diseases that we know nothing about here where we live today, and they are excluded from this authority. Does it say that there? It says, all authority. So we begin to read through, and we say, well, it's just it's the gospel account. No, I want you to understand something. We miss it when we read the Word of God, and we don't read it with understanding. We, we read it through the eyes of our needs. Somebody say amen. We, we, we read it through the eyes of what we want to see and what we want to hear. And, and we miss sometimes what it's actually wanting to say to us. So today, here, here's the principle that's going to happen today. I believe that church is a place that's good for teaching. Amen? I, and I, I believe teaching is important, and I'm going to teach today. But I'm going to tell you what's going to happen bigger and better than the teaching. Because I, I believe that some things, when it comes to the spiritual, are caught and not taught. That all of a sudden, it's like a light. How many know what I'm talking about? A light comes on. Anybody know what I'm talking about? All of a sudden, it's just like, wow, there it is. That, that you can walk in the pragmatic and you can say, well, two plus two equals four. That's true. But can I tell you something? Uh, let me give you a little hint today. This is not the mall. It's not Walmart. Come on now. It's not even a place where people are gathered to socialize. There's something spiritual happening here. We are spirit, soul, and body, and God's spirit is in this place. And because of that, something spiritual is happening here today. And you see, we try, we, we try to ascertain the spiritual through our mental and through our physical, and it just doesn't work. The only way Jesus said that you can attain to the spiritual is through the spiritual. He said a man's not born again physically. It happens through the spiritual. 
So Paul says in the, in the book of Colossians chapter 2, look at this, verse number 9. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. So I want to understand what the Scripture is saying today. There is nothing, absolutely nothing, not under the authority of Christ. All demons, all sin, all death, all disease are all under his authority. Somebody say amen. amen. So I'm going to make you understand what our issue is. You ready? Just like, like you, I'm wondering. Man, I'm getting beaten up. I'm getting tore up. I'm getting... And, and, and is it my lack of faith? Is it my lack of righteousness? Is it, is, is it my lack of cognitive understanding and wisdom? And, and I'm going to tell you what it is. It's none of those things. My lack of victory had nothing to do with any of those things. It was a lack of understanding about the authority that we have in Christ Jesus. We're going to talk about that today. Because I want you to understand something and hear what I'm about to say because we're, we're going to get this teaching in the next couple of weeks. We're building upon building upon building. If Christ is victorious, how many of you believe that Christ is victorious? If Christ is victorious, why are we still fighting? You say, well, we live in an imperfect world. Uh, and in this imperfect world, the prince of the power of the air, the devil still rules and reigns, and there is still sin in this world. And until we go to heaven, we're going to fight this forevermore. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to give you a new understanding on that today. Uh, and we're going to understand how the devil got his power. But we're also going to understand that when we come into Christ Jesus, we no longer fall under that authority and power. Now, you can if you want to. I, I don't want to, though. Hey, Amen. I don't want to fall under that. So it's not a new concept, and it goes all the way back to the beginning. And we're going to read a little while. So just bear with me today. We're going to start in Genesis chapter 1. We're going to start there at the beginning of the world where God spoke everything in existence. We come to chapter 1 of Genesis, verse 26. And then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. There's some key words here I want you to circle, underline, or remember. It says, they will reign. There's a key word. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, and all the wild animals. That's a key word there too. Circle it. Wild animals on the earth. And the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said... This is God speaking to man and, and his wife. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Moving down to chapter 2, verse 18. It says, Then the Lord God said, It's not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God, God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky, and he brought them to the man to see what he, the man, would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. And he gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the air, and all the wild animals. But still, there was no helper just right for him. Stop here for just a second. Here's a little advertisement in the middle of Scripture. I know that sometimes we need a little advertisement in the middle of Scripture. Coming in February for all of you married folk, uh, we're going to have a marriage retreat down here at the Hampton Inn. Uh, we're, we're bringing in some of our favorite counselors, Dr. Rich uh, and his wife, Cynthia. They're going to come. Uh, and I'm going to tell you, it will help your marriage. No matter where you're at in your marriage, it will help your marriage. So I'm going to, you say, well, I can't afford it. Listen to me. There are all kinds of things we can't afford. If you don't want your marriage helped, then you really can't afford it. I mean, we'll make sacrifices for all other things and say, well, that, mar that marriage retreat is just really too expensive. But when our favorite rock group comes to town, we'll, we'll dish out 500 bucks for a ticket. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so the Lord God calls the man 
to fall into a deep sleep. And while a man, the man slept, the Lord God took out one of man's ribs or from his side and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made the woman from the rib and he brought her to the man. And at last the man exclaimed, this one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. Now the man and his wife were both naked. This is an important scripture here as well. But they felt no shame. Chapter 3, verse number 1. The shepherd, the, the serpent, the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. Verse 6 is a key. I've got it circled and underlined my Bible. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious. And she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Now, here's the one thing I want us to all to understand here, and we're going to illustrate over here by the kingdom of God. It's right over here. It's on the right side. I plan on living in God's kingdom forever and ever and ever. How many of you plan on living in God's kingdom forever and ever? That is your plan today. Well, let's understand something about the kingdom of God because we can learn a lot from the Garden of Eden about God's kingdom. God's kingdom is full of order and not disorder. Everything and every person in God's kingdom has a place and they know their place. It's not like the chaos we have in the world where everybody's fighting for a place. In the kingdom of God, there's going to be a king that rules forever and ever. and Everybody will have a place and they will live in complete harmony and joy and love. There will be a lot of people not being the kingdom because they don't like that concept. Because they want their way. They want their idea. They want their preference. They want all those things, and they don't want that kind of order in their life. And so there's another place where there's going to be complete chaos and darkness forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. <laughs> and it's a chaotic place where people are going to think what they want to, believe what they want to, be in complete friction and disarray. No peace there forever. Can you imagine? I don't want to go there. But when we examine this story of man in the beginning, we get this picture that man is born as royalty. That there are words that are expressed here that he is going to reign and to govern over everything that's under him. Seed-bearing plants, wild animals, livestock. Uh, he's given the authority to name all these things by God. And so we can get the picture here that man is the Lord of this domain. Now, I didn't say he was God. But a Lord is someone who's been given authority over things. And man is now the Lord over the domain called planet Earth. He's given that authority and power. That the wild animals growl at him and he says, be quiet. Not appropriate in your house, but you might say, shut up. <laughs> and the animals shut up. We get this picture of who man is, that he is born, created in the likeness and manner of God, and God enables him to come and to rule and to reign. And in this picture of ruling and reign, Adam is walking with confidence. Uh, you understand something. People say, well, he's naked. He's walking in confidence because of who he is in God and the authority that's been given to him. And so there's no shame in him. There's no doubt that walks in him. Uh, that God's given him this authority. He says, all you have to do, hey, hey, come with me today. Let's name these animals over here. God didn't name them. He said, 
you come and name them. And so he is the Lord, born royalty, he's the Lord of this domain. But we get a picture here that along comes a serpent. Now, I I want us to understand something, and and let's go back and see this. It says the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals. Anybody, Anybody saw that? But it also says earlier that when God's speaking over man, he says, and they will reign over the fish of the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock. Listen to this. And all the wild animals on earth. So I want us to understand something. Adam is the overlord of earth, and even the serpent himself is under his authority. The serpent is under his dominion. The serpent has to do what he says. And the serpent comes one day, and he begins speaking to the woman. Now, this is a lesson inside of the lesson. We should be very careful of the voices that we listen to and empower. Because the voices that we empower are often given the authority to rule over our lives. Let me say it again. The voices we empower are often given the authority to rule over our lives and eventually put us into bondage. And so we get a picture here that Adam comes... And from one moment, he's over here ruling and reigning and being the Lord. And the next minute, he he knows he's naked and he is shameful. And you say, well, the devil's plan, the devil's plan all along was to make man sin. And I'm going to tell you something today. That was not the devil's plan. Because it's the same plan he's trying to carry out in your life today. And you ought to get a picture of it. In fact, you need to take a mental picture right now. The devil is not coming into your life to try to make you sin. The devil came to Adam because his plan is just like Jesus said is in John chapter 10. What did Jesus say about the enemy? He, the thief comes to what? Oh, some of you know that. He comes to steal to kill and destroy. What did Satan come to keep? What did he come to steal? Adam's authority. He took the crown off of his head and all of a sudden he becomes the prince and power of the air. He wasn't the prince of the power of the air until he stole it from Adam. Until he took that throne off of his head, it took him off the throne and took the crown off of his head and put it on himself. All of a sudden, he becomes the ruling authority and he becomes the ruling authority. Listen to this. Look at this. Adam goes and becomes shamed and in bondage immediately. Now, how important is this message? Well, I want you to understand, what does the enemy want to come to do in your life? He wants to come and steal. What does he want to steal from you? Your authority. Because here's some pictures if you'll get them. And we don't understand how all this works. Peter says, 1 Peter says, that we see a picture of Adam. And and 1 Peter says that now we are kings and priests. Uh, Can I tell you something? There are a lot of warnings I wake up and I don't feel like a king or a priest. Anybody know what I'm saying? But he says, we're kings and priests. Paul says in Romans, oh, you're going to like this. The first Adam comes, and he relinquishes his authority. And then he says this. But the second Adam comes, who is Jesus Christ. Listen to this. And he takes it all back. Come on now. He takes it all back. In Revelation chapter 1, he says, look, I have the keys. He's already been defeated. I have the keys. I've already won all authority in heaven and on earth are now mine. That behold, the word of God says, behold, there is nothing that's not under my feet. But we're over here fighting the devil. 
Wah! Come on, devil. The devil's just beating me up. Can I tell you something? He's not beating you up. Did you hear what I just said? He doesn't have to beat you up. When he takes your authority that you don't know who you are, he can come at will and do whatever he wants to do. The only time that you have to put the armor of God on, listen to me. In Ephesians, you say, there's the armor of God. What's that all about? When you come to your understanding of who you are in Christ Jesus, he's immediately going to come and bring indictment and fight against you. He's immediately going to come and whisper in your ear and say, you've always been a loser. This has been in your family forever. And he's going to bring these indictments because he's the accuser of the brethren. Just like he done at the beginning, he's going to do again. And if you don't know who you are and who Jesus is, you're going to buy into it hook, line, and sinker. And all of a sudden, you're going to be one of these people. Well, it's the grace of God. I just hope I make it to heaven. Well, listen, Jesus is victorious. And here you are mealy mouth in his kingdom and his authority. He says, I've won. Which I'm not so sure. Don't feel like you've won. I'm getting beat up all the time. So this is what I believe. Oh, it's, it's, it, we're, we're going to run deep today. You ready? It's not about what you learn up here. Paul prayed for the church in Ephesus. Chapter 1, verse number 16. It's the prayer I've been praying over my life. He said this, I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly. Same prayer he prays in the book of Colossians. Asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom. That, that means the spirit of wisdom. And insight so you might grow in your knowledge of God. What in the world is that spirit of wisdom? He's going to elaborate and tell us what it is. Listen. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so you can, here's the key word, understand the confident hope he has given to those he called, his holy people who are rich, who are his rich and glorious inheritance. Let's stop here and let's go back to that. So that you can understand the confident hope he has given you. When I read that this morning, I thought about my daughter, Abigail. Man, she's doing great. She, she's running our varsity kids department next door. Doing a bang-up job with it, just letting you know. But in, in high school, she was a high school golfer. And I'm going to tell you something. She was a good golfer. But even today, we have conversations. Because it's not just me who sees it. Everybody that I know that knows Abigail and ever played golf with her or ever been around her, they all say, wow, she, she, she was a great golfer. She could have done anything she wanted to do. But you talk to her, and she'll say, Ah, I wasn't that good. Ah, I could never attain to that. And it absolutely drives me batty. How many parents know I'm talking about? That you can see a potential, but your kids don't want to see it. That's what our Father God is saying to us. I can see a potential in you but you're going to have to see it in yourself so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power. Now he's going to tell, talk to us about it. For us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in heavenly realms. Now, that's important. Stay with me because here we get a picture that Christ, he's come to a place of completion. His work is done. He is seated on the throne. Verse 21 says, Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything anything else not only in this world but also in the world to come God look at this God has put all things everybody say all things all things, all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church 
And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. So here is the great revelation of confidence that Paul is praying over these people. That God has given you this great potential of confidence that you can walk as believers. And I pray that you're going to come to understanding that you're able to walk out your full potential of what God has created you to be. But in order for that to happen, you first have to understand who he is. Because when you understand where, where he is, who he is, and what he has accomplished, that he has taken back the throne, that he he has taken back that crown off the devil's head. He has kicked him in the butt. He has knocked him out. And all of a sudden he said, I am here and it's complete. And I'm sitting down just to show you that it's complete. I'm not worried. I'm not overwhelmed. I'm not standing up on the throne thinking this is a really bad deal. And I'm going to have to do something about it. It is a complete work. Now that's a picture, isn't it? So we get that picture. And Paul continues the picture of our understanding. Get this, Ephesians 2, 6, right down a little further. For he has raised us. Say me. Come on, everybody say me. me. He has raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. Let me illustrate this for just a moment because we don't get it. You say, oh, it's a bunch of flowery language we can't understand, written in the original Greek language, and we just can't comprehend it. I'm going to tell you something. We can perfectly comprehend it. We're letting the devil hand our butts over to us every day, and we're not walking in victory because we don't understand our authority, because we don't understand what he's done, so we can walk in that authority. that He's given us the power of attorney to walk on his behalf on planet Earth, just like it happened with the first Adam, that he's given us that same type of authority that we don't have to walk and be defeated. Can you imagine depositing your check in the bank on Friday and the next day you're needing some money so you go to the bank and you beg them to give you your money? You say, that would be pretty stupid. Yeah. Or imagine with me that you have spent a lot of your paycheck to go to that concert and you've got the ticket. And you've got the ticket in your hand, and you're going through the turnstile, and you fall on your knees and say, please let me in, please let me in, please let me in. You've already got a ticket. But you know what? That's what we do as Christians. Because when we change our understanding, it changes our prayer life. You see, there are a lot of things, because we don't understand who he is and who we are, that we're begging God for that he's already given us. Oh, Lord, would you please make this devil leave? There is nowhere in Scripture where you beg to make a devil leave. In fact, the devil doesn't respond to compassion ever. The only thing the devil responds to is authority. Jesus never begged sickness and disease to leave. He was snatching back. He was, man, back slapping that devil and, and kicking him in the tail and taking that crown off of his head and saying, you know, it's not yours. But what has to happen is this. There has to be a change in our understanding and embrace. Can I tell you something? I want to be in this kingdom of order. Where everything and everyone has a place. You say, well, I'm not certain God has a place for me. Oh, really? Jesus died on a cross for you, and he has no place for you. What sense does that make? He sent his only begotten son to die for you, and you think that he doesn't love you? He loves you. He loves you and wants the best for your life. So here's where we're going today. Is there anything that's not under his feet? Now Ephesians tells us this, it takes a step further, that here he is seated in high places, and the Word of God tells us that we are now with him in union. 
in covenant, in a new covenant. Uh, And we are seated at the same place. And so if everything is under his feet, guess what's under our feet? Wow. Listen, I'm not talking about being arrogant and prideful because there's no room in the kingdom of God for that. Let me just tell you, there's no room in it. It's still his kingdom. It's still his authority. It's still his power. He's the one that went to the cross. I didn't do anything. He just gave me the power of the attorney to carry it out. I mean, I can't take credit for it. I didn't die on a cross. So I don't come and say, in the authority of Alan Neal, come out, devil. No, it's in the authority of Jesus that I now have authority. You say, Pastor Allen, I just want somebody else to believe for me. Can I tell you something? Why did Paul write this letter to the church, to people in the church, just like you and me, people in the church? He didn't write it to pastors. He didn't write it to apostles. He wrote it to ordinary people to explain to them, it's not just for preachers that have the authority, that every person who calls on Jesus should walk in the authority and power of Almighty God. So listen to me. Are there any sins that's not under his feet? So greed is under his feet. Lust is under his feet. You see, we play with a lot of things that we shouldn't play with that we should just take authority over. Devil? That's not, that's not a part of me. That's not a part of my redeemed nature. And I take authority over that lust right now in the name of Jesus. And guess what? It has to leave. There's not a multiple choice. It has to leave. Why does it have to leave? Because he's already defeated. But hold on just a second. Here's the greatest tool. The greatest tool he comes at us with is not a sword, it's not a spear, it's not even a bomb. The Word of God says that he is the accuser of the brethren. Who do you think you are? I saw what you did yesterday in private when everybody left and you're looking at the computer by yourself. I saw how you treated your wife and kids yesterday. Who do you think you are? You don't have authority. Just stay in your place. You know how many Christians listen to that word again? And they stay right in the miserable place, right where they are, and they never have victory. They're the people that espouse, I'm all about the grace and mercy of God because you can't get here by yourself. You understand, it's all God's grace and mercy. But this is a real warped sense of grace and mercy to say, well, God loved me just the way I am, and he created me, and it's nothing that you're a new creation in Christ. It's nothing about your authority in Christ Jesus. It's all about woe is me, and I guess I'm always going to be this way, and the devil just comes and goes as he wills. Can I tell you why he comes and goes as he wills? Because you don't walk in any authority. Ooh, this is good preaching today. Oh, man. The voices that we listen to are the voices that we empower. You need to quit listening to those voices that say, well, your family's always been that way. You better shut that voice up. I am a new creature in Christ Jesus. The Word of God says I am a king and a priest, and he's put me in this place, and I now walk in this place, and I don't have to listen to that mess anymore. That's how important the Word of God is. You've got to silence. That's what Jesus did. The devil didn't come to him with bombs. He came to him after 40 days of fasting. First and foremost, he said, if you are the Christ. And then he used Scripture, and Jesus said, "Ah, no, you're not going to play that game. Uh, You're not going to play that game on me. And he threw it right back in his face and said, no, you don't have that authority. He come to him and said, listen to what he said, I'm the prince of the power of the air, and I can give you all of this. Can you imagine telling Jesus, I can give you all of this? 
Uh, we laugh. It sounds stupid. Jesus doesn't fall into the trap because he knows. I'm going to let you think you whoop me and put me on a cross. And then I'm going to go down to your domain. And I'm going to give you a double fist of whoop right then. <laughs> and I'm going to take everything you have and all the people to this point that you think that are yours. I'm going to preach to them and I'm going to set the captives free. And I'm going to set up a new kingdom. So here's the thing that we have to do today. Romans 1. I mean, I'm talking Ephesians chapter 1. I pray that you might come to a spirit of wisdom and understanding so that you may grow in the knowledge of God. See, it has to be caught. Now, let's be honest here. How many of you are tired of getting whooped? No, come on now. How many of you are tired of getting whooped? I mean, I was talking to Doug this morning. Uh, he could get up and tell you his story, and you, you would hear what, how his last two weeks have been, and you would say, all that can't happen to one person. I mean, anything and everything, vehicles, home, I mean, everything, you can imagine kids, all under attack. And I said, here's the obvious thing we know. This isn't an accident. It's the devil. He's overplayed his hand. So we're just going to take authority over him right now. Guess where you are? Under my feet. You say, shouldn't we walk in humility? Are you talking about shame? Like Adam when he sinned? Or are you talking about confidence in knowing who you are? I'm not going to walk in shame and apologize for putting him where he ought to be. I'm not going to apologize that he's brought divorce to your family for years and now he's wanting to destroy your marriage. I'm not going to apologize for that. I'm not going to apologize that you believe that you have inherited mental illness. I'm not going to apologize for that. Why are we apologizing for the authority and power that's been restored to us that started in the very beginning that he was born royalty and we're trying to talk ourselves out of it? Or the devil's going to fight this message. You, you better take it to the bank today. Because when you get this in your heart today and you say, I'm going to walk in that. And he said, well, we'll see about that. Because he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. What does he want to steal? He wants to steal your crown. He wants to take your authority and keep you in bondage. Can I tell you something? And I hope you'll agree with me. He's not my Lord. I am not in his kingdom. I'm not under his authority. I'm in a new kingdom under a new authority. And I'm seated with one who already has the victory. So we need to pray for understanding, and then we need to prepare for the fight. Because you say, Pastor, of all the weapons in Ephesians, there's only one offensive weapon. You're right. It is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Don't tell me you don't need to know your Word. And Jesus came back and quoted the Word back to the devil. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God, you sorry dog. Get out of here. Today, you say, Pastor, I want everybody to bow your head and close your eyes. I need to catch this revelation. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand right now and say, Pastor, I need to catch this revelation today. 
Pastor, I need to catch this revelation. Come on, raise your hand. People can't. People are raising their hands. I need to catch this revelation. I, I, I'm tired of walking in defeat. I, I, I need to catch this revelation today. I need to catch this revelation for my family. I need to catch this revelation for the sickness, disease that's come against your family, against your finances. You say, I need to catch this revelation today. Now, here's what's going to happen. His hands are going up. Something's happening right now. Because all of a sudden, there's a move happening that you didn't expect because of the authority. There's healing going on in this place right now. There is freedom from addictions going on in this place right now. There's all kinds of things happening right now because the word has gone forth and you're responding to the word that does not return void. You know, some of you are already standing. If you feel like that's what you need to do right now, just go ahead and stand and say, that's me. I, I know that God is leading me into this revelation. Go ahead and stand up. If you've got your hands raised, just stand up right now. Just stand up right where you're at. Just stand up. Just stand up. Just stand up. Devil, you're not going to have them. <laughs> you're not going to have that. It's not yours to have. Everything I have belongs to him. I say it often, Lord, you've withheld no good thing from me, and I will withhold no good thing from you. Everything that we have, Lord, we surrender right now. Everything we have, we surrender we surrender it all to your kingdom, to your authority, to your power. And we speak to all sin and death that rules and reign in our life. We say, you have no longer have authority. We are marking our boundary today. And in the name of Jesus, I declare freedom right now in the name of Jesus. I declare healing right now in the name of Jesus. Devil, you are underfoot today. If you're here today and you've never walked in the kingdom of God and you walk in shame and guilt and you walk in bondage and you say, I don't want to walk in that any longer, I'm going to give you the opportunity when we close today. We've got a prayer team up here and they want to pray with you. Maybe you say today that, you know what, I need to establish this with someone else because the Bible says we're two or three agree. We're going to agree the devil is underfoot in this area of my life and I'm going to agree. You need to come up here today and you need to pray with somebody and you need to agree with them today. Because in that power of agreement, things are established in heavenly realms. Amen? Things are established in heavenly realms. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added. Father, I pray over your people that their eyes of understanding will be opened that they'll see and recognize your kingdom, your authority, your power, your strength, your might. And Lord, what the power of eternity you've given to us as your followers. That the greater things you spoke about is because the authority you walked in, you've now passed on to us. And Lord, we can walk in that authority. I pray the devil has to leave marriages right now in the name of Jesus. The devil has to get out of that house right now in the name of Jesus. He has to leave that house right now in the name of Jesus. We take authority over that oppressive spirit that's trying to come in and destroy families and marriages right now in the name of Jesus. Some of you are already under attack for this message and you know it. And if, you, if you're under attack, I think we just need to, we need to have a concentrated prayer for you today. If that's you, I want you just to excuse yourself and come up here, come up forward right now and say, I'm, I'm under attack and I know it mentally, physically, I'm under attack. Come on, just don't wait for anybody else. Just come on up here. Prayer team, I want you to just disperse and begin praying for folks right now. Lord, I pray for every person here that as we leave this place today, that this message will go deep inside our hearts and minds. 
that it'll resonate within us, that it's something that we've caught in our spirit that says, I don't have to put up with that. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I, I can walk in that authority he's given me. And Lord, we, we accept that today. We accept it today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for being here today. We're going to pray with these folks down here and love them. God bless you. We look forward to seeing you next week. Stick right here around. If you're going to be in life groups, stick here and, and, and we'll start in just a few moments after we get through praying.